Hi, um, welcome to session um, 11 on data sciences. Um, we, you know, data is one of the biggest topics of the modern age, how we use it, how it's used, um, how the security of it. And we're going to kick off today with um, Peter Brenton and Anne Bowser on data quality in citizen science. So, Peter, are you there? Great, thank you, Holly. Um, so, I'm Peter Brenton. Um, Anne's up very early in the morning. Um, so, Anne and I will be speaking about uh, data quality in citizen science from a big data um, aggregator's perspective. And uh, to illustrate that, uh, we'll be using um, the Atlas of Living Australia, whom I work for, and uh, the Wilson Centre's uh, work on um, Earth Challenge 2020. So Anne will speak to that as we go through. Um, so the Atlas of Living Australia, for, for those not familiar, is, is one of the um, big data aggregators in Australia. We deal with biodiversity occurrence data primarily. We're funded by the Australian government. Um, and um, we're hosted by the premier research uh, science organisation in Australia called uh, CSIRO. Aggregated data um, enables uh, much more effective scientific research um, because it's it's more accessible and standardised and there's larger volumes for, for um, um, larger scale analysis. Um, so it provides more research opportunities by fast tracking um, access to data and license uh, um, open licenses uh, for data uh, and informs policy management, uh, community participation and, and also it, um, functions as an educational resource. The Atlas of Living Australia currently is aggregating more than 90 million records from 825 different uh, uh, data sets and about half of that is uh, citizen science derived um, from about 165 different um, sources. It's useful to look at this from an information supply chain perspective about the, the uh, relationship between um, citizen science and the aggregation sector. Um, so data collection um, or data is collected in a number of different situations uh, in systematic research in um, observations, uh, ad hoc observations uh, at the record level. Um, and they they come in through uh, data sets into the Atlas of Living Australia. And um, the ALA is also a partner member of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And um, so all Atlas, all data that uh, comes into the ALA is then um, also passed on to the uh, Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, the data is used uh, by um, researchers and analysts uh, to produce various uh, data and knowledge products. And often those actually highlight gaps uh, which inform new data collection needs. Um, they also uh, end up in product, uh, knowledge product catalogues, which uh, uh, can be searched and uh, can then be used by um, uh, various agents in applying the knowledge. Um, and that in turn also drives new data collection needs. So a perspective, uh, just a, a real life perspective, this is the Australian kookaburra. There's two species of kookaburra in Australia. And um, a perspective like this is not possible without aggregated data. And uh, so the ALA provides this uh, uh, big data context. And the green tick boxes, uh, they're the data sets that are derived from citizen science sources. Um, others are from various uh, state-based aggregation sources um, and um, other research data sets. And over to you. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, so I'm from the Wilson Center, and together with Earth Day Network and the US Department of State, we launched a new platform earlier this year called Earth Challenge 2020. 
And the idea behind this is that the 50th anniversary of Earth Day was April 22nd, and Earth Day and state saw this as an opportunity to try to modernize the environmental movement and make it more participatory through citizen science. So we started out with two goals. The first was to create a platform for sharing more high quality data for research and decision making. And the second was creating a new mobile application to allow citizens to be more educated, empowered, and activated. And we looked across six initial research areas, plastic, air quality, climate change, food security, water quality, and um, insects. So this is our equivalent of the supply chain. We've got a mobile application, which actually doesn't contribute that much data to our aggregation. It's, it's valuable as a platform for linking observational data collection and analysis to action. Mm -hmm. So every time somebody submits a data point, they receive a prompt called what you can do that contributes uh, an opportunity to drive policy action by, for example, signing a petition on a single use plastic ban that is customized to where in the world somebody is, as well as the research area that they studied. Then we have two platforms for data aggregation. The one that's live and shiny right now is the Citizen Science Cloud, which is hosted on Esri's ArcGIS. And this is a really user-friendly way of accessing APIs. Uh, the second I'll talk about in a moment. And because we're a lot less mature than ALA, we don't have the same level of partnerships as Peter, but we are brokering one-off partnerships with different stakeholders across each of the topical research areas. So this is an example of our map coming from aggregating three citizen science data sets in plastics pollution. This is about 55,000 data points over five years. And we're working with the United Nations Environment Program and IBM to take this data and feed it into a platform that IBM built that will be used by the member states for reporting against Sustainable Development Goal 1411. Is that one you were saying? This is perfect. And this is what it looks like in the background. We're actually in the process of migrating from AWS to Azure. So I'm not sure if this link is live right now or if it will look good if you go to the website. But we've got over 50 million records. The reason for this is that we deal with air quality data. So we're very lucky there and that that's just sort of inherently big data. Uh, we're bringing together data from two low cost particulate matter sensors, um, Purple Air and Sensor.Community. So that accounts for a lot of what's in there, but we also have 10 other data sets. And the only other thing that I'll highlight here is that most of these are citizen science, but we do have one reference grade air quality data set, which is EPA's Air Now. And we're exploring this as a way to bring together reference grade data and citizen science data around the same topics, which will help out with data quality issues. So uh, I just thought it, it's useful to talk about uh, the different aspects of data quality, I think, and, and um, what it means to you. So, so we've just looked at the supply chain and why uh, the, the role, I guess, of big data aggregators. But um, uh, it depends, I guess, on uh, being able to properly describe the data as to, um, you know, when you start aggregating data, it's important to uh, for people to be able to make informed decisions about its use. So, so um, there's different aspects to quality. Um, so there's accuracy, there's how closely um, the data value actually um, represents its true or real property that's being measured. There's a precision measure, which is a range of uncertainty in the resolution of a property. Then there's uh, completeness, so whether a data set actually has all the required fields um, as part of its uh, its um, you know sort of range of information. Um, consistency, so whether all the methods have been applied consistently across the data set. Um, the factual correctness or validity of individual records within the data set, and then the timeliness as well. So whether they're temporally um, uh, uh, relevant, um, obviously uh, uh, present, uh, previously present, now absent, has relevance for um, things like uh, invasive management. No data set is actually perfect. Um, 
and so decisions about uh, whether to use it or not in research is really governed by its fitness for use. Different different quality uh, data can be used for, for different purposes. The more accurate um, a data set is across its uh, um, all those six factors, uh, the more useful it is across more different um, applications. Um, so things to think about in terms of fitness for use is, is the quality of the data adequate for, for the use that it's going to be put to? And how can I know whether it's valid, complete, consistent, how it's collected and treated and so on? Um, and that's all described in the metadata. Uh, so the metadata is actually quite important for people to make in, downstream users to make informed decisions about its fitness for use. Um, and this has bearing on uh, the perceptions of trust. So uh, downstream users uh, will make decisions about whether they trust the data for the purpose they're putting it to um, based on how well it's described or not described um, across those various uh, factors. Um, so those uh, that range of criteria are the sorts of things that, uh, that often researchers uh, look for. So where does it come from? How is it collected? Who collected it? How accurate is it? Um, what sort of curation and validation methods have been applied? Um, what sort of biases are there in the data and conditions on use and how to cite and reference it? Um, so, Anne, I'll flick over to you for that one. So just echoing Peter's point about metadata being critical, we take a similar approach. We do bring together, in the case of air quality, citizen science and reference grade data to co-locate them and do some simple correlation analysis, things like that, to show common trends and try to elevate the perception of the citizen science data in different people's minds. But we also take a pretty sophisticated approach to data documentation. For the API platform, we make the data available in two formats, one being the raw data format, the initial data format, and the second being OGC's Sensor Things API standard, which contains fields at the data record level for documenting a lot of metadata, including things like a description of data collection protocols, uh, whether the data was validated or not, even down to the single record, and then also allows for creating links back to an authoritative page like the one that Peter just shared, which would contain a lot more information about process. Great. And, and just to uh, to finish up, we've just hit uh, time. So just to finish up, um, I thought uh, it, it's worth just mentioning that um, there's a been a, a group running that uh, both Anne and I have been involved in for some years uh, called the PPSR Core Project. It's running under the CSA, um, uh, the Citizen Science Association's um, uh, uh, working group structure um, and is a, a global multidisciplinary project to define a set of standards for um, uh, project information um, data set information, the sorts of things that we've just, just uh, been through and explained, and, um, and also the observational level data attributes um, that covers things like sensor of, uh, sensor of things. So thank you for your, for your participation. Okay, amazing. Um, thank you so much, Peter and Anne, for that amazing talk. Um, it was very informative about um, uh, data, quality of data and data and citizen science. Um, so we are now going to pass over to our second talk. Um, so this is about personal data protection in citizen science. And today this is given to us by Andreas Mateus. Andreas, over to you. Okay, thank you, Oli. So welcome everyone to my talk on citizen science and personal data protection, the land sense approach. Well, when you talk about citizen science, then you often need to consider personal data as well. So even not all citizen science projects need personal data, but some of them do. So uh, reasons for why you want to use personal data is, for example, building trust into the contributions. And um, so you can build accreditation profiles. Um, you can identify individuals if it matters. So here is, that is the first cluster of where you want to use personal data. Well, the other thing is that um, often 
people contribute into citizen science um, because they want to get known. So Alice contributes to Frog and Joe creates something about hazards to birds and um, they want to be known. So um, they may choose an attribution license like Creative Commons BY. And now if you want to reuse their contributions, this um, requires a proper um, attribution of the author that involves personal data. But still, you need to consider that there are applications and services out there that really don't need personal data. So, for example, a geofencing service um, that just intersects geometries that has no need for personal data. As soon as you talk about personal data and you are in Europe or in the EEA, the general data protection regulation from the European Commission comes into play. Um, here are some fundamental aspects that you would need to consider. Well, the GDPR in itself is a really great achievement because it establishes a free movement of personal data, not only in Europe, but also in the EEA and perhaps worldwide, um, but you don't get it for free. So you need to consider that applications and services uh, must be adopted. So there are some aspects of GDPR that these um, applications and services must implement. There are also um, processes that perhaps need to be adjusted or established that consider where actually personal information is used, how much personal information is used, how much is stored, how long, and all these aspects. So these are things that you need to consider when you are using personal data. In addition, there are some general principles, and here are some um, examples, um, what the GDPR requires you to implement. So first of all, if you are dealing with personal data, then um, a user must actively agree that his data is being processed. And um, this consent is typically context specific and it's revocable. So you need to make sure that your implementation actually is compliant with that. And there is this aspect of minimization. So um, if an application is um, authorized to see an email address of a user and the use of that personal datum is um, um, explained in the privacy statement, then the application is not authorized to get the uh, user's phone number or the um, postal address. So it needs to make, uh, the application needs to make sure that only that information is available that really is necessary and um, is outlined to the user in the privacy statement. So the applicability of GDPR is um, limited to the uh, European economic area. Um, so the immediate question is, okay, how do you deal with personal data exchange outside the EEA? Because there is the world out there and not only EEA. Um, I give, um, an example of how Landsense um, has dealt with that in a later slide. So on this um, figure here, you can see the components of what Landsense built, has built in, in the project. It's the engagement platform. And you can basically see that there are some different um, categories here. So we have the Landsense Federation, we have core services, and we have the campaigns with applications and everything um, in this is uh, considered the Landsense engagement platform. And most important in there is the Landsense authentication as a service. So this authorization server actually is the service that um, controls the flow of personal information coming in from login entities in the Landsense Federation. And the personal information is then filtered and processed a problem uh, accordingly to GDPR and the um, information, the personal information is forwarded then to services and applications as these, um, as the uh, amount is necessary for these application and services to work. So why a federation? Well, mm, we, we thought that it's good idea and user-friendly to reuse existing accounts. So, um, that was the reason 
to start something like a federation with Facebook and Google. So you have millions of users already that can use um, these logins to participate in LandSense. But then we had the LandSense partners. They also had databases of users for login. And then finally, we considered that hmm, it is also important that the results of citizen science and from this project can be made available to academia and research. So we extended the federation to also include Educain, which is a um, the academic uh, entities worldwide, and it's 2,850 plus entities where all these users can now log in and use the uh, uh, LandSense engagement platform. So the idea of creating something like a core service, um, like authentication as a service, um, was born very early in the project. And um, it was quite clear from the beginning that it needs to be based on um, interoperable standards. So we considered to use OpenID Connect and OAuth 2 um, for the API of that service. So that ensures that uh, developers of applications and services can leverage existing SDKs uh, to actually implement the AAAS. Well, um, establishing a federation with trusted login partners gives you the ability to manage um, all the um, um, identity providers, all the entities on that federation. Um, as I already said, it includes Edugain, but it's also extendable. So you can um, add other entities if you want. So basically, the idea of the authentication service under the hood was, well, this service is there to manage the exchange of personal information between users, applications, services, and everything in the LandSense engagement platform. In order to, um, to deal with the different aspects of, OK, a project needs personal information, a project doesn't need um, personal information, um, this service implements different policies that control the flow of personal information between users and applications. The first policy is basically asking a user to log in. So the application and services do only know that a user has successfully logged in via one of the partners. And um, this doesn't give any uh, personal information to the applications. So here, a user can basically um, participate anonymously um, because it is not possible that personal information is linked. The next policy, uh, we call it crypto name login, controls there is also no uh, personal information available to application and services, but there is a unique user identifier generated, which is always the same for the same user across different um, applications and different services. So it allows the user to better manage their contributions on different portals, on different platforms. And it also allows to collect um, and cluster information for the same user. Important is that this unique identifier is decoupled from personal data. So it's non-resolvable. So any application um, receiving this uh, unique identifier cannot use it to request personal data. And then there is the full login policy where the application determines what personal information is required. So for example, username, email address, et cetera, et cetera. And once the user has approved, has given consent that this personal information can be accessed, um, this becomes available to the application and services. So the lessons learned, well, mm, we started uh, implementing the service before GDPR became effective. Um, so that was the legal part wasn't that easy. It was quite difficult to understand all the implications of GDPR and uh, figure out what all needs to be implemented if you want to realize a service that is basically a broker of personal information between identity providers in a federation and application and services registered in LandSense. So um, we implemented it and um, we have um, crafted a very comprehensive privacy policy. And in that, we also deal with how do you um, actually exchange personal information with countries outside the EEA. 
Well, basically it is that when you register a service or an application with the AAAS, you need to promise that your privacy um, functionality is at least equivalent to GDPR, and that is about it. Basically, um, operating this AAA um, as a help for developers to implement GDPR compliance without implementing it again and again and again uh, was quite a success. Um, and um, very important um, for this um, application, uh, for this service is basically the, the interoperability out of the box. So um, if you put it on IT, libraries that everyone is that does know then the um, the uptake um, is quite easy so putting um, application put putting the, uh, the the service api on uh, open id connect and oas2 um, was a good uh, way forward um, because this guarantees the interoperability based on uh, sdk libraries available to everyone so what we have also learned is that early education on standards and technology um, is key because it guarantees you at the end of the project sustainability and interoperable work. Finally, coming to sustainability, um, well, we implemented this AAAS service in Landsense. We deployed it and operated it. And um, until the end of the year, it will be there. Um, so very many campaigns in um, in Landsense have uh, used it. In particular, BirdLife has running campaigns in uh, Spain and Indonesia using the uh, Natura Alert uh, web and mobile application. Uh, one uptake of the Landsense project is the authentication as a service in uh, H2020 Cost for Cloud. Um, there is, so there is a separate uh, hosting as Authentix EU, and uh, the plan is to have this AAAS service as an add-on to the EOSC authentication to support GDPR compliant interactions between users, apps, and services. And um, that's it from my side. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you, Andreas. It's a really interesting talk and something I think that is so important now, um, especially in the time where security of our data is uh, such an important topic of conversation and the laws are constantly changing. So thank you very much. It was a very nice talk, Andreas. Um, so Pleasure. up next up next for our third talk, we have Jean-Pierre talking about um, cost for cloud and integrating citizen science in an open data cloud. So are you there? I think you're muted. Sorry, give us one second. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear Amazing. me now? Yep, we can hear you now. Great. All right. So, so, good morning, everyone. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on on the audience. Yes. Uh, what we will try here in this in this talk is try to to show a little bit the opportunities that we will have in in citizen science and in particular on the platforms in citizens observatories in the context of the new. I would say infrastructure framework of the European Open Science Cloud. So to try to illustrate a little bit these opportunities, we will talk a little bit about the observational challenges uh, in the context of citizens of observatories. What are or what we define as services within citizens observatories? What is this, I would say, general infrastructure, the European Open Science Cloud, and how we can create what we call it, or well, in the context of the EOS, is called the minimum viable ecosystem of, of services. So basically, in, in, in citizens' observatories, we want to address one of the challenges, which is general, but um, uh, that, that can be summarized somehow in the, in, in, on the need to get more data everywhere at all times. And in the context of citizens' of observatories, we try to address this challenge by engaging people and providing observations. But no matter what type of technologies we, we, we use, at the end, what we want is to, to, to get all these data in global repositories that can be accessible to, to the rest of the society, not only on from the academic point of view. So if we think in, in one of the, I would say, common services in any kind of, of citizen portal, citizen observatory, is a system to validate the data. So we can imagine here one 
volunteer providing raw observation that can be validated in different ways. For example, in this first example, the inputs from other participants can help on validating the observation through a collaborative system. On the other extreme, we can imagine uh, there are some, some portals that what they use is automatic validation using artificial intelligence-based systems that provide the way to validate the, the reported observation automatically. In the context of Cost for Cloud, we have involved several examples of existing citizens observatories that will address more or less these data validation services in a different way. We have uh, platforms, uh, citizen observatory group related to biodiversity, in other cases to environmental quality. But in any case, more or less, um, they can be linked somehow to this different type of validation. This is one of the examples of the services we, we, we plan to provide. Obviously, we want all these validated observations uh, to these global repositories. And in the context of the European Open Science Cloud, the idea has been that um, the Commission uh, has identified the need to somehow federate all these platforms in a single framework that will help uh, and improve the overall services when all, all of them somehow work together. Um, and the idea is to provide new services and resources that help in this type of federation of services. This is a general, it's not specific for citizen science, but what we provide or we propose in, in the Cost for Cloud project is to develop a kind of external cloud-based services that will interact with every single different type of citizens observatories to provide a better global repository. What is better for us? Well, basically what we will try is to provide more and better data. It's one of the ideas of, of this challenge we referred at the beginning. Obviously, this requires to think in terms of open science and also in the interoperability. We need the way to, to make these services available to all the different uh, um, platforms, so the citizen observatories, if they more or less talk the same, I would say, technical language. That's why it's so important, the interoperability. Let's, let's have an example of what type of services we, we have in mind. Let's try to think how we can improve the validation. Well, we have seen that the, there are different ways to validate the data, the raw data, and, and these provide what we call community validation associated to every single um, um, portal. We, we, we can think an external portal in which different experts can access to this different type of data and they can provide their own validation. So we have an added type of validation, which is based mostly by experts in this field. Keep in mind then that we have the advantage that every single expert do not need to know exactly the different type of the different uh, platforms. It's out of, of that community, but can help to all of them because we can see that there is then the, the feedback. So every single portal can re, um, validate different observations that can return to the different uh, citizen observatories. This is creating, as you can see, uh, uh, what we call this minimum viable um, ecosystem. There are several uh, citizens of observatories working somehow in a collaborative way thanks to this external portal that allows the different experts to co to in interoperate with or yes with the different users on in the different portals. In a similar way, we can think on new systems of automatic identification tools. These systems can. So, can provide automatic validation that can be used in different ways, recommendations from these, I would say, um, artificial intelligence uh, services that provide extra information recommending which would be the, the final um, value of the final identification of these raw observations. There is also a loop because um, these automatic identification tools, usually they need some data to be, tra for, to be trained and this data com could come from the expert validated data sets, but also from the community, community validated data sets. And this, that's why we think that these, these kind of loops that at the end what they provide, it's basically um, more data and, and better data in terms of quality. Anyway, um, I would love to show you many different uh, services that we are trying to offer within Cost for Cloud. Um, basically, in this talk, I, I've been uh, commenting things about um, 
data gathering and data validation, but the idea of cost for cloud is going beyond that uh, type of services. So we can have many other type of services that are within very useful uh, within the context of creating these uh, minimum viable ecosystems. For example, we can have personalized notification systems so people can uh, obtain in uh, new um, ways of the, of, of, of um, notification. Imagine, for example, in the case of the expert portal, the system can provide a notification that an expert has validated your data, for example. And we want also to know um, this not data use notification and user exp experience in terms, for example, uh, to improve the acknowledgement of, of the people if they are co collaborating, providing either um, data or they help on, on validating. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, one of the also important aspects in, in Cost for Cloud is that all these services are planning to be co-designed. That means we want to know the interest or the opinion of the people from the very beginning, so they are not designed from scratch. And giving these kind of examples, uh, what I will um, tell you is that we invite you, whoever wants to be part of this Cloud for Cloud community, are very welcome. So there could be like three, ma three main major groups in which you could participate if you want. One is the co-design. So it will be part of this creation of improvement of the existing services to be um, um, developed in the context of the European Open Science Cloud. You could be part of the panels, just advising uh, the needs or new needs that we 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 need um, in in the context of the of the project. And also, once these services have been put it uh, uh, to be available for the users, you could be part of the testers uh, in terms of. Up to, to to verify up to which point these services are useful, even not only for the, the um, um, citizen science platforms uh, already involved in the project, but maybe there could be other externally that can uh, also take advantage of these new services. If you want to be part of this, um, just um, please, um, I hope that in the chat you could add this, this link. With this link, you can fill a form to join us and, and be part of this Cost for Cloud community. And basically, is what I wanted to say. There are also the possibility to, to follow us in our website and also in many um, um, different media. Um, and do not hesitate to contact us if you need further information for that. And um, thank you very much. OK, um, thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Um, that was a really interesting talk about Cost of Cloud um, and all of your work. So I don't believe we have any questions for you right now um, so I'd like to go on to the next talk so the next talk we have is about empowering individuals and communities to use personal um, data protection for citizen science and this talk is given to us by Bastian Savarez um, I hope I've pronounced that correctly sorry if I haven't yep. um, no problem uh, Bastian brilliant uh, take it away yeah good morning evening whatever time it is for you as well and i think this talk fits in nicely with what andreas just talked about the, the use of personal data in citizen science but here we are going a step further i would say it's actually not so much about using the personal data for identifying people but rather using personal data generated by individuals for doing citizen science and this is getting more and more important as all of us create more and more personal data it can be our google search history our location history which is in google maps or our phones to just keep track of it our social media use wearables and some people even do personal genetics testing so there's like a lot of data that can be used for citizen science but at the same time, using this data in citizen science, it's still pretty hard. And the top reason, of course, is this data is all stored in silos. So it's stored in all of these different company databases. And access to it is not very simple. And also, it often has a huge lack of standardization. So wearable device data coming from Fitbit might be very different from your Apple Watch and so on. And last but not least, basically, there is the high expertise needed for using the data. So you need to be very comfortable using data science methodologies if you want to learn from these data individually or have a co-created citizen science approach. And all of this together leads to a really a lack of shared knowledge, which Neil Sayan, who also talked yesterday, already presented in one of his papers. So people end up reinventing the wheel again and again. 
So we try to minimize these barriers in open humans and enable really collective self-research on our own data. And open humans, it's an open source web ecosystem, which was basically a data aggregator as well. So what it allows individuals to do is import data from all of these different sources into a private storage space in open humans. You have your own data there, it's stored privately, and then you can already start as an individual to start exploring this data to learn about it yourself. And the way we are doing it is that we run our own Jupyter Hub setup, which is another open source software tool for writing data analysis notebooks so that people can make their own data analyses. And these data analyses can be shared. So we have like an exploratory or gallery of notebooks that people have made. And people can browse them and preview notebooks that other people have written, filter them by different data sources, and then run them on their own data. So if I write a data analysis notebook for, let's say, GPS data, and I publish it there, if you click on the notebook and say run, it runs your own virtual private machine in the cloud, which has access to your private data and reproduces it using your data instead of mine. And a more clear example is here's a notebook made by a user which has geolocation data that it tries to visualize for a member. And if they run the notebook, so here in this case, you see my notebook of me traveling in Iceland in August. If you run it, you would see where you have been based on your Google Maps data, basically. So this already makes it very easy for people to use the data themselves and to reuse data analysis provided by a community of people interested in analyzing data. And this is the first step only, but the next step is to actually have more people interacting with this and try to make the barrier for participation lower. And the way we are doing it is through uh, one approach that we had was a peer-to-peer -peer learning process, which we called the Keating Self-Research Self Memorial. Stephen Keating, a good friend of us at Open Humans, he was a board member of the foundation, unfortunately passed away due to a brain tumor in the summer of last year. And he was very big in doing self-research. He got his own genome sequenced. He got his cancer genome sequenced. He even got a 10 plus hour recording of his awake brain surgery. And he made all of these available and did research on the data himself. So we ended up collaborating with the quantified self community to make a program in which people, we try to help people doing their own self-research to use their personal data. And the way it was structured is by having weekly group meetings of people interested in doing research on their own data. So basically ending up doing a lab meeting for self-researchers. And this gave people a space to share their updates of what they've learned since the last meeting, which questions they might want to explore or if they had any open questions and get help by the peer community. And of course, also find inspirations. And last but not least, very interestingly, what people mentioned time and again was like, this weekly group meetings actually led to some accountability because you didn't want to show up week after week without having anything to present. So people actually ended up doing the project and felt more committed to it. And at the end of the project, which was end of July this year, we had public presentations where we invited participants to have, give a show and tell talk, which basically addresses three questions. What did I do in my research? How did I implement it? And what did I learn from doing it? And we had many people actually doing this. We had many events around this as well. And just some example projects that people did using their own personal data. One person, because of the pandemic, of course, a very timely topic is how did the shelter in place orders in my city influence my life? So did my productivity change? Did my physical activity change? Did my mood change over time? Did I sleep differently? Questions like this. Another participant looked into his personal hay fever symptoms over the spring and the summer and could see how different medications influenced it, what doesn't have an effect, and so on. And similarly, in the, also in the US, we had a participant who did self-tracking on his cardiac arrhythmias, which he basically did at home, collected data himself, and then took it to a medical doctor instead of paying a lot of money in the US for getting a professional uh, cardiologist to collect all the data for him. And of course, you can do research as well, which is very different from what traditionally would be done. So we had one participant look in the effects of transgender testosterone therapy, and they were interested in how in does the biweekly injections influence their mood, but also over the transition period, how does it change in terms of the pitch of the voice? So things which traditionally people in a more academic setting would not do, but very much driven by the interests and by the motivation of the individual self-researcher. And that's what people can do just by themselves on their own data. But more interestingly, of course, is also how can we scale this up and make group experiments out of it? And Open Humans allows this as well. 
It allows people to share data anonymously or pseudonymously. People also get a crypto ID to share it with academic projects, but also community-driven projects. And I will just briefly highlight two community-driven projects, which are led by participants without any researchers being involved or traditional researchers being involved, because that's a bit more, more interesting. And the first one is Dana Lewis, who built the Open Artificial Air Pancreas System. I won't go into a lot of details because that's Dana's story to tell, but basically Dana has type 1 diabetes and she is the person who developed together with a community, the open artificial pancreas system, which basically links a continuous glucose monitor to the insulin pump. And they wrote algorithms to automatically pump insulin when the continuous glucose monitor data shows that they actually need to pump insulin right now. So it means there's no more human intervention needed or at least very little. And this makes like a huge difference in the quality of life of patients with type one diabetes. And because Dana made all of this open source, a couple of hundred people around the world are now using the same system for this. And this system then collects data, which of course the individual owns and they don't have to share it anywhere, but also they started doing data commons through open humans. So the individual collects data through what they call Night Scout, which is the name of their app. Then an individual can choose to collect this data in the web app and transfer it privately into their Open Humans membership account. And there the individual themselves can decide where to share this data again. And as I said, they built not one but two data commons, one for people who just hacked their continuous glucose monitor, and a second one for people who also made the, the open artificial pancreas. And now participants can donate their data in these data commons. And the nice thing is these data commons are run by the patient community themselves and not by academic researchers. So it's the patient community who decides who's getting access to these data because they have a much better idea of which research, research questions, for example, are relevant for their interests. But of course, as the data is already stored in open humans, you can also use the data for further experiments. And if you have any idea, you could make a project which either you do as an academic researcher or the patient community does it themselves. For, I know, for example, that the diabetes community is currently working on some projects about how different diets affect how much insulin they need to use. And this is all powered by things which are completely owned by the community and they just use open humans as the central data store and as the, the consent management system. Another patient community I want to highlight is about cluster headaches. And it's called No Bism. It's run by basically one highly dedicated patient out of the Netherlands originally. And he made this app together with a small community of people to track cluster headaches. Cluster headaches, if you don't know them, are really terrible headaches. They are sometimes also called suicide headaches because they so get that sometimes people end up killing themselves just to make the attack stop. And there's very little research budget into analyzing this data or understanding what's going on. Despite being as prevalent, I think, as multiple sclerosis, they get a fraction of the research budget. So they made this app, which allows them to track when they have cluster headaches, how bad they are, what potential triggers are, and also interventions and medications they take to make it stop or prevent having attacks in the first place. This app, which runs on Android and iOS, is storing the data locally, but again, the individual can decide to link it to an open humans account, store the data privately there. And of course, data collection is only one thing that you want to do as a patient community. You want to make sense of this data individually and collectively to learn from the data. Unfortunately, in this case, the community didn't have any expertise locally to understand the data and analyze it. So they did a very nice thing and actually partnered up with the Code Academy, where you had lots of data science students that learned data science and that knew how to analyze, visualize data. And they made a collaboration and said, OK, you can get anonymous access to the data that's stored in open humans if the individual consents to us, of course. But in return, we ask you to not just analyze the data, but give back reports to individuals. So what happened was the data science students did develop data analyses and then returned it to patients, which otherwise would not have been available. And then going from there, actually, people can share this data as well. For example, the cluster headache community decided to make a public data repository where people could donate those reports created by students to actually do patient advocacy and say, this is what we see. This is how our actual experience is having this. And later on, it actually can lead to more patient-led experiments. And you see on the slide, there is an example of like how many milligrams of magic mushrooms do you take? And I said the, the Patients, are many of them are from the Netherlands where it's legal to use magic mushrooms. So they actually started experimenting with microdosing magic mushrooms and found that 
according to their preliminary data, it seemed quite promising to prevent having cluster headache attacks, so at least minimize the frequency. And based on patient-led experiments in the first place, I think there's at least now one clinical trial in the US underway to try the effectiveness in a more rigorous scientific setting or like an academic research setting than would be possible by, by patient-driven research alone. So this is just to give a very brief idea of what people can do with this ecosystem. It's all very modular. You can make your own projects and invite people to share data with you. But of course, this requires a lot of trust and governance for this data because it's often potentially sensitive data like location data or your genome. So how can we do this? And we decided that it should not be us as the foundation or me or any other employee who decides, but we want to do it collectively with the community. And the first step is that if you want to run a project or an activity that invites people to share data with you, it needs to be reviewed, but it's reviewed by the community. So what happens is you make a forum post on open humans and say, I want to get my project reviewed. And here's an example of the genetics of personality type. And you say, this is the project in general, yada, yada. And you say what you want to do with the data and so on. In this case, it's they are interested in looking at the Myers-Briggs type indicator and see whether it's related to genetics at all. And what happens then is that the community starts discussing. And here we have two very different responses to the same thing basically posted on the same day. The first person says, yeah, it's fine. I had the, the IRB approval is there, so ethics has been approved by like an official body for this even. There's nothing of concern for me. But the second person says, well, I do not approve. Basically, the Myers-Briggs personality types are pseudoscience garbage to just paraphrase what he says, and we shouldn't be doing this. So that's interesting, but then they started going back and forth and this discussion took, I think, a couple of weeks even until the community came to a consensus, which was, okay, in this specific case, we believe like they will not find any results, but also the study is not harmless. So we do accept running the study, even if we don't believe a lot into the research outputs. So the second thing is how people can actually participate in the governance is that Open Humans is run by a nonprofit foundation. And it, of course, has a, has a board of directors, which is the highest governing body. And usually these boards self-elect each other and like people rotate in and out. But in Open Humans, what we are doing instead is that every participant, if you have an Open Humans account, which is just registering on the website, you get a vote once a year to actually elect community seats. And you can even nominate yourself. So once a year, there's like an email going out saying, OK, and the board elections are coming up. You can now nominate yourself or others for, for running for the board. And then there's like a, an election period where people can basically ask questions to the nominated people and so on. And in the end, everyone again gets an email saying it's time to vote and people can vote. And that's one third of all the board seats. And that's really interesting because this allows you to not have like very fine grade decisions or method of voicing concerns for individual projects, but you can actually influence the overall governments of the community itself. So just to wrap it up, so using personal data and citizen science, it's pretty hard. And even with open humans, there are still many barriers which are not easy to overcome. But we aim to minimize these by having people use their own data with the support of peers and have them make per project decisions on how this data can be used in a variety of projects, be it academic or participant led. And to make this all work besides, of course, being GDPR compliant and everything, it's very important to us at least that participants play an active role in governing the ecosystem. You can check us out on the website. Our Slack is open to join for everyone and many discussions happen there. And that's it from my side. So thanks. And I hope we have a few minutes for questions at least left at the end of the session. And it looks like we don't have, ah, there she is. Hello, sorry. Um, so, sorry, my computer disconnected for about a minute and a half. Um, have you guys answered the questions yet? How are we doing nope, with we, Bastian's we questions? Have. Okay, um, Bastian, can you see the questions? Um, sure. Well, I can see the questions things? and I can try to go through them one by one. I will also repeat them, of course. Yeah. So Debbie asks, how would you describe the profile of people engaged in open humans? And Dorina has like a very similar question. No, Petra has a very yeah. similar question. I think I would say 
age, it was spread from mid 20s to 50s to 60s. Gender was, I would say, a bit male leaning, but we had also female and non binary participants. And the area of expertise was very broad. It was social sciences, it was engineering, computer sciences, biology. I mean, overall, probably overly educated compared to the general public, I would say. But at the same time, people used a wide variety of methods. So it was not all hardcore statistics or devices. Some people literally just used the spreadsheet and Excel and collected data that way. And let me see, is there any more questions? And yeah, I mean, just to, to go to the question of like the, the ethics of these big corporations using the data. And I mean, I fully agree. It's problematic how much data is collected about us. And that's not actually available to us. And I think what we are trying to do is actually flip this around a bit and give people a way to retake control over the data, which otherwise would just be stored somewhere without them having even access to it and giving them a way to use it for their own research purposes, or at least for doing good in a larger sense. Okay, yeah, one more new question has just come in for you, Bastian. So yeah. there is documentation for the governance rules in the official bylaws of the organization, especially for electing the board seats, of course. And there's also the governance rules for the projects in the documentation for how to set up a project, where the last step is you can basically open humans, it's all based around APIs, which you can use right away, but you can only use it on a very small set of test users, basically, and it's not publicly available. And then the last step for actually launching a project is get approval by the community. Um, amazing. And we have one last uh, question. Oh, um, actually, sorry, we're going to go to the question for Andreas. Andreas, you there? We had one question um, previously. Can you see it? Just yes. So the question basically is how many user use federated accounts on multiple platforms? Well, I think at the moment in citizen science, that is not the common practice. The common practice is that you have your own account in isolation in one platform and you use that only for contributions in that platform. You have another account somewhere else. So that is the typical um, scenario at the moment. As Jaume presented on his slide, um, in Quest for Cloud, we are actually facing this um, data, data silo and all the different platforms. And we want um, this um, expert portal to connect to all these data silos. And um, if you now put that into EOSC, then you have a federated platform so where people can actually use their federated accounts. So. At the moment, I think it's all isolated. People use direct accounts in all the different platforms, but the future, the near future, and already introduced by AUSC is to use your account in a federated environment. So you can log in once and then use your login with all the different services that are in the platform, for example, EOSC. So the short answer is, I don't think it's a common practice now, but it will be in very short, in the very short future, and in particular in EOSC. Okay, brilliant. Um, thank you very much. So that is um, um, that is us. So we're going to do one last question, um, and that's for um, Yame. Uh, Cost for Cloud is intended for new projects. Or is the idea also to migrate some existing initiatives to Cost for Cloud framework? Yeah, well, the idea is that there is no Cost for Cloud framework. In fact, it's the European Open Science Cloud framework. So basically, what we are trying to facilitate is to provide some examples, but um, um, how to, this could be done. But obviously, the, um, the main purpose for the European Open Science Cloud is to integrate as many as infrastructure as possible. So the idea is, well, at least in the European context, but I'm sure that there are other initiatives that goes at global scale will be welcome as well. But the idea is that, as um, Andreas mentioned, we, we realize that in many cases, the, the major benefit will be trying to work together somehow. So there are different platforms, more or less, addressing similar issues, why not try to work, work to work together? And the idea is, okay, let's federate, 
let's have common authentication systems and things like that, that at the end, working all together, I think we, we can try, we, we, we could improve at, at the end, uh, the final, um, I would say services or infrastructure, or whatever you want to call it. But that's the idea behind Europe, the European Open Science Cloud. The only thing we, we do is we, we are trying to, to, you know, to apply this idea in the context of the citizen science, although it's, it, it, now it is promoted in any kind of uh, scientific discipline. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, so that is the end of our session today. Um, thank you everybody for coming and thank you um, most importantly to all of our presenters who did some amazing talks and um, really lovely. And yeah, just as a reminder now, I believe there is a lunch break and a sponsored lunch um, after the session. So yeah, thank you to everybody. Thanks guys. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Thank you.